One of the things that we've been working pretty actively on is something called ecological performance standards. If you really want a metric, you really want something to strive for, why not ask the local ecosystem what the appropriate metric should be? So how many tons of carbon dioxide are fixed here and shouldn't our developments fix the same amount? How many gallons of fresh water are stored? How many kilograms of biomass are stored? Those are really the performance standards that we should be looking at because we know that's what allowed these ecosystems to thrive. And so we've got a couple of projects in India where we're setting those standards. We're asking the local forest, what are the rules of water infiltration here? This particular one is in near Pune, and we found that despite the monsoon that gets 11 meters of rain a year, 11 meters, 70% of it infiltrates back into the soil. So that created the standard for the designers working on the project to make sure stuff like permeable pavers are incorporated so that 70% of the water ends up back in the soil. That becomes the metric for that area that fits in in that place. Nature as mentor is asking ourselves if nature is something we can learn from, maybe it changes our whole relationship with it. Right? You wouldn't actually steal from your teacher. You wouldn't exactly take everything your teacher had to offer, but you would instead have an entirely different relationship, and therefore we move into a space of, of really thanksgiving. Right? Thank you for allowing me to be here, teacher. You are my mentor. One of the things that we do in specific localities is we do these things called survive and thrive studies and genius of place reports. What are the secrets of being here? What are the secrets of living in Ireland? Who's thriving here and how are they doing so? What is the genius of this place? Right? You don't actually have to be a biologist to go figure that out. Sometimes it's merely going for a walk and asking some questions. I took some architects on a walk in the desert and one architect was really inspired by the barrel cactus, who has its own self-shading mechanism. And in addition to the pleats which create shade, the cactus also changes the density of the stomata. And the stomata are what, are let, are what lets air and water in and out of the plant. It doesn't want to lose water, but it needs the air to to photosynthesize. And so on the outside edges of the ridges, it has very few stomata and deep within the cracks, it has a lot of stomata. So he designed a high rise based on the same idea, self-shading, and then he changed the density by changing the size of the windows depending on where it was in the grooves. Right? Short, quick story, and so this building's not built, but in the models of the building, huge, huge improvements in efficiency in keeping the building the appropriate temperatures. So really what all of this is about, these are just a few examples. Our database has over 500 examples and, and I can't even keep track of them anymore. They're coming in every day as more and more people are asking, how does nature do this? How can I learn to fit in again? Right? We did fit in at one point on this planet. How can we fit in Again, who will be our inspirational models? It's about creating conditions conducive to life. We actually have two organizations that do so. We consult with big companies, um, Shell and Boeing and Procter Gamble and Hewlett Packard and all over the place. I'm learning more about industries than as a biologist I ever imagined I would. And then we have a, a nonprofit that does a lot of education and outreach. And just to give you a sampling of some of the things that we do, because there's a lot of things that are designed to be accessible for all of you. Uh, we have university curricula. We work with universities. So this is taught to biologists, to designers, to engineers, to business. We have um, biolutions, where when we find incredible ideas that just have to happen, we get them out there. We get them into industry and say, hey, you've got to learn from this creature. There's something really, really cool here. We do field courses where we take people into the jungle, into the prairie, into the forest to learn, to go for walks, to practice and hone their observational skills. We have exhibits. The um, <clears throat> next big one is actually opening in Eindhoven in Holland in October. Uh, 
at the International Center for Sustainable Excellence, if you happen to be venturing that direction. We have a children's CD with incredible music called Ask the Planet um, that gets kids excited and it has a whole accompanying curricula for K through 12 teachers to um, bring this into their classroom. More programming, lesson plans. Kids love this stuff. And then they look at us adults like, duh, you know, why aren't you doing this? This is what we want to do. We do student design challenges with colleges. They've got to practice their work in the university. Why not give them real challenges to solve? Give them real issues that need addressing? We do food web workshops where we help organizations see where their flows of energy and material and information uh, go so they can act more like an ecosystem instead of some sort of linear, isolated, out of context system. We've just certified um, the first graduating class of certified biomimicry professionals. So I have one here in the room from Turkey. And we're starting our next class in January. I had um, 89 people from around the world, every continent except Antarctica, um, apply for the program with just 16 slots. We have workshops we do for industries. We do lectures. Um, I consider myself a biologist at the design table. And you'll probably find wherever you are, wherever you're working, that there's actually a bunch of closet biologists, right? <clears throat> These are people that went and fell in love and studied biology and were not able to find work in it, right? So if you're not a biologist and you're feeling lost right now, you probably have a friend that's a biologist that would love to tell you about the secrets of the hedgehog. We do product reports, tell the stories of what's out there. We do deep, deep research, amoeba to zebra, what are all of the organisms doing? We build innovation habitats where you can go and get inspired right in your own back door. We have a one-year program. We're developing online courses. We, there's a global demand. This crosses all boundaries, all boundaries. When I travel and I get into a taxi, if there's no public transportation, the taxi drivers from Pakistan or something, and I, what are you doing? And I tell them, and they're like, yeah, of course. Of course. This is universal, a universal appeal. So we're building an alliance network. There's a group that started just recently in Holland. I know the UK is building one. Lots of places where you can reach out and touch this. Some of our favorite programs are Innovation for Conservation, because I'm up here and I'm a translator. These aren't my ideas. I don't hold any of these patents. Nature holds the patents, right? So why not give back? Should not the ultimate manufacturer of gecko tape be paying some royalties back to the geckos? Right? Imagine a world in which, in which some of the shareholders were actually the organisms that brought about these profits or process savings. Could we not protect the habitats in which these organisms live? Protect the wellspring of these ideas? 